So chapter five is about somatic symptom and related disorders and also dissociative disorders. So just like we discussed in chapter four, I'm going to go over those DSM criteria, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through the nuances of them, but I am going to talk to you about some different disorders that fall in this category and um, how it's treated. So first off, somatic symptom disorders are going to be um, things like illness, anxiety disorder, somatic symptom disorder, conversion disorders, and uh, fictitious disorders, and any other psychological factors that affect medical conditions. So when it comes to your somatic symptom disorder, soma means body, just like in a cell. So anytime somebody has a somatic symptom disorder, they are pre preoccupied with their health or their body or their appearance and their functioning. And the thing about somatic symptom disorders is there's no identifiable medical condition that's causing the physical complaints. So these are people who have psychological issues that manifest in physical ways. So doctors can't treat them medically because they aren't medical issues, they're instead psychological issues. So when it comes to a clinical description of somatic symptom disorders, this occurs when there's the presence of one or more medically unexplained symptoms, substantial impairment in social or occupational functioning, meaning you just can't, can't make it through your day because of this issue. There's also um, extreme concern about the symptoms and um, those symptoms can become a part of a person's identity. When it comes to the statistics related to somatic symptom disorders, um, they are relatively rare, um, but many of them actually occur in adolescents. Um, it's most likely to affect um, those who are unmarried and women of low socioeconomic status. status. So think about why that might be the case as we talk about some of the symptoms. Um, the course of the disorder is pretty chronic, lasts for a while, and research to date is limited due to um, the redefinition of the disorder in the DSM. It's changed a little bit. So here are those um, diagnostic criteria according to the DSM-5. And there's the rest of them. So the main thing you want to know is these are going to be psychological symptoms that present themselves in physical ways for probably more than six months. Somatic symptom disorder with predominant pain occurs um, when people have clear physical pain that is medically unexplained. It used to be called just a pain disorder. Little is known about its origin, but 5 to 8% of the population may have this disorder. Causal factors in somatic symptom disorder. Um, we don't know a lot about what, it cause, what causes it, but it could be a family history of illness. So there's preoccupation with illnesses. Also stressful life events. Uh, for some people, they experience their stress in somatic ways. Um, sensitivity to physical sensation and... Um, Let's face it, a lot of times, you know, when people have medical conditions, they get some attention. And for some people, it could be that there's benefits to experiencing an illness um, and maybe there's monetary benefits. And there's also, you know, attention and time and, you know, a lot of to do that's made up for you if you have some problems. So that might be some internal motivation there. When it comes to treating somatic symptom disorders, once again, cognitive behavioral therapy is the best treatment. You'll hear for a lot of these disorders that CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy is a great treatment. And that's because, honestly, it looks at a person's thinking, their behavior and their thoughts and how it all interacts and impacts their life. Now, obviously, there are some disorders that won't work well with CBT. I'm sorry. My fingers are getting a little happy there. But uh, most of them are going to work well with CBT. Also, reducing the tendency of visiting medical um, specialists and engaging in behavior that we call doctor shopping. So if you don't hear what you want to hear from one medical professional, you know, going to another person for their um, opinion or for them to diagnose you with what you want to know could also be a problem. And let's face it, in society, what are we taught if we get a diagnosis you know, that's devastating? It's a good idea for us to get a second opinion. 
So people who have somatic symptom disorders, though, they don't just get a second opinion. They get a third and a fourth and a fifth, and they just shop around until they find somebody who will diagnose what they want. Um, also assigning a gatekeeper physician, somebody who kind of keeps the person in check is, can also help with their treatment and um, reducing the supportive consequences of talk about um, physical symptoms. So really just not focusing on the disorder can help with treatment. Another somatic symptom um, disorder is illness anxiety disorder. Um, this was previously known as hypochondriasis. If you've ever heard of somebody being called a hypochondriac, this is where it comes from. Here are those um, DSM-5 criteria for the disorder. Once again, it's going to last for more than six months. These will be physical complaints without a clear cause. Um, and the experience of severe anxiety about the possibility of having a serious disease. Um, there's a strong disease conviction here. Um, medical reassurance doesn't help. There's a tendency to doctor shop to find the right condition. Um, once again, hypochondriasis. Um, so when I think about illness anxiety disorder, um, a good example is somebody who says they have a headache. And, you know, the headache has been going on for a while and they go to their doctor because they think that it's a brain tumor. So these are people who have these physical complaints that don't have a cause and they often think it's something severe. Um, illness anxiety disorder is prevalent in about one to five percent of the population. Onset can happen at any age. Um, it doesn't affect males or females um, more than the other. It's equal. And it also can have a chronic course. There are a few other culturally specific disorders that also can relate to illness, anxiety disorder. So when we start to think about causes, we have to start thinking about thoughts and cognition and how these distorted perceptions could impact our expression of our symptoms. Also family history of illness. Treatment, again, CBT is generally effective. Antidepressants can also help. Um, lots of psychoeducation is important and challenging sort of those irrational beliefs and misconceptions about their symptoms. Here's figure 5.1, which again is continuing with the sort of triggering event, sort of what leads um, to the idea that, oh gosh, there's something wrong with me. I have an illness that's going to, you know, impact me and how it affects your body, how you respond. Another um, somatic symptom and related disorder is a conversion disorder, which is sometimes also called functional neurological symptom disorder. This occurs when a person has um, some type of sensory or motor functioning that is not happening properly and there's no medical cause for it. Um, there's no organic pathology. Um, the person is probably going to maintain their normal functions, but they don't have awareness of that. For example, it might be someone who can't speak, although there's no medical cause for their inability to speak, or someone who's blind, um, but there's no medical cause to their blindness. And honestly, conversion disorders are very hard to explain because this is somebody who is seemingly healthy, who believes their thoughts are telling them, you know, and it's their anxiety that's manifesting itself that way. So here's the diagnostic criteria for a conversion disorder, according to the DSM-5. Main thing is going to be that motor or sensory functioning that is not happening. When it comes to the statistics related to a conversion disorder, it's very rare. It can have a chronic intermittent course. It can, can oftentimes be comorbid with anxiety and mood disorders because oftentimes the reason a person experiences a conversion disorder is because it's how their anxiety manifests itself. Um, it's also seen primarily in females. Think about what the cause of that might be. The onset can usually be in adolescence, and um, there are some common cultural and religious groups that could have conversion disorders as well. 
The cause, though, of a conversion disorder is not well understood. You know, oftentimes people think of past traumas or some type of Freudian idea of an unconscious conflict uh, manifesting itself in a physical way. And once again, if we think of that, those primary and secondary gains, am I going to get attention? Am I going to get sympathy? Am I going to get money? Because people, you know, are concerned about me. When it comes to treating a conversion disorder, we want to treat it. We want to treat it in many of the same ways we would also treat a somatic symptom disorder. If um, the onset is after a trauma, there might be processing of the trauma that needs to happen. And um, we also always want to remove any type of secondary gain. We don't want to give the attention. We don't want to give money. We don't want to make a big deal about it. And um, we don't want to constantly have the, the person talking about what they are experiencing. We want to reduce that um, talk about physical symptoms. We also can have factitious disorders, and this occurs when a person purposely fakes physical symptoms. This is different from a conversion disorder because with a conversion disorder, the person isn't trying to fake it. Like they are, but it's because for them, it's true. With a fictitious disorder, this is someone who seeks out the purpose of faking a physical symptom. So they can cause those physical symptoms to occur by doing something to make them occur, such as eating, drinking, ingesting something that they know will make them sick, or they can just pretend to have those symptoms. Many times people who develop fictitious disorders don't obviously have any type of external gains. Um, we have to be able to distinguish this disorder from malingering. Um, which um, a person is malingering when they um, fake these physical symptoms um, in order to get time off, avoid service, um, or something like that. Here are the diagnostic criteria according to the DSM for a factitious disorder. Um, there can also be a fictitious disorder that's imposed on another. Um, oftentimes, this is known as Munchausen by proxy. And um, this occurs when a person induces symptoms in another person. It's typically a caregiver who induces symptoms in a dependent person like a child. Um, and the purpose is to receive attention or sympathy or money or some type of gain. There's been lots of this that's happened in society. Um, I can't um, think of the young lady, but there was a, a young Munchausen by proxy case that you know made Lifetime and, and various um, news outlets a few years ago. There could be some psychological factors that also impact medical condition conditions. Um, and that's a diagnostic label that's useful for clinicians. It indicates that those psychological variables may be impacting a medical issues. So like um, chronic anxiety could attack and worsen a person's asthma. A ne needle phobia can make it impossible to get, get important blood work done. We know that having good psychological health, health is going to positively impact our physical health as well. Now let's talk a bit about some dissociative disorders. So dissociative disorders involve severe alterations or detachments from reality. It could impact a person's identity, their memory, their level of consciousness. It they could involve depersonalization, whether a person has a distorted uh, perception of their own body, their own experience, feeling like they're, you know, their own body isn't real and they are not attached to it. A derealization could also occur, which is where a person loses a sense of the external world, almost as if they're living in a dream. There are four different type of types of dissociative disorders that um, are classified within um, the DSM-5. Starting with depersonalization or derealization disorder, this is um, 
a disorder where there's recurrent episodes in which a person has sensations of unreality of one's own body or surroundings. They feel dominant and interfere. Um, their feelings dominate their lives and interferes with their ability to function. Um, it's only usually diagnosed if prim the primary problem involves depersonalization and derealization when they don't feel like they are aware of or in control of what's happening to them. It's almost as if, as if they are living a dream. Those symptoms can also kind of manifest itself in a way um, that panic attacks and PTSD does. There's usually a high comorbidity um, of anxiety and mood disorders with depersonalization and derealization disorders. It affects about one to 2% of the population. Onset is also typically in adolescence. It usually runs a lifelong course and um, there could be a history of trauma that makes the disorder more likely to manifest as well. You know, when somebody has gone through a traumatic event, who's to say, none of us can say how that trauma is going to manifest itself in their life. I also want you to think about why do you think of many of the disorders we talked about today have an onset in adolescence? What could it be about that time period of a person's life? Think about the goal of adolescence and what you're supposed to be doing during that time. How could that impact the development of a psychological disorder? Here are those DSM-5 diagnostic criteria for um, depersonalization, derealization disorder. When it comes to treatment and risk factors, cognitive deficits in attention, short-term memory, and spatial reasoning could be a risk factor, as well as being as easily distracted, um, having tunnel vision and mind emptiness. Um, little is known about the best treatment method for depersonalization and derealization disorder because there's just limited research. So if you're interested in the field of psychology and you're thinking about going into it in the future, this definitely is an area where research um, needs to be done. Another dissociative disorder is dissociative amnesia. This includes several forms of psychogenic memory loss where a person um, can have localized or generalized or selective uh, periods of amnesia and maybe even some dissociative fugue where they travel or wander to a new place and they take on a new identity. They have no idea about a previous life or how they got to where they are. They're unable to remember how or why they've ended up in a new place. Here are the diagnostic criteria according to the DSM for a dissociative amnesia disorder. We also know that dis dissociative amnesia and dissociative fugue um, usually begins in adulthood. Um, it can have an, a rapid onset and dissipation. There's little known about the causes, but it is believed that trauma and stress can serve as triggers, maybe even a little bit of anxiety. When it comes to treatment, um, most people are going to get better without treatment. Um, most people will also remember what they've forgotten eventually. Another dissociative disorder is dis dissociative trance disorder. And this um, is when people have symptoms that are very similar to the other dissociative disorders, but um, they can also have sudden changes in personality. And they often attribute this to being um, possessed by a spirit. Um, it can present itself differently in other um, cultures, and um, it's only considered a disorder if the, it leads to distress, it leads to um, impairment, um, where they aren't able to function due to the trance-like state. Once again, the cause is often a life stressor or a trauma. Little, very little is known about how we can treat it. Um, but addressing the stress or the trauma, the anxiety that a person ex is experiencing might be a, a good way to start. And then, of course, the most popular dissociative disorder is dissociative identity disorder. Um, it was formerly known as multiple personality disorder. It's the one disorder that many psychological movies are made of. Um, 
The distinguishing feature of dissociative identity disorder or DID is dissociation of personality. People can adopt or take on or have as many as a hundred or more personalities, or they could have um, you know, one or two other personalities. The average for most um, people with dissociative identity disorder is 15. Um, identities can usually display themselves um, by their own unique personalities, their own unique behaviors, their unique voices, and their posture, although they look like the host. The host is the person whose body all of these personalities um, help. There are some unique aspects of DID. Um, there can be alters, which are different identities or personalities. And the host is the person who keeps all of those identities together, although they may not be, even be aware of them. And the switch is a quick transition from one personality to another. And of course, um, we don't necessarily know if somebody is going to know for sure when that's going to happen. There's a nine to one female to rail ratio. It's a large number of females who tend to have DID. Onset is usually during childhood or adolescence. Um, there's also high comorbidity with other lifelong and chronic issues. Um, and it's generally thought that about three to 6% of the population suffers from DID. Here are the diagnostic criteria according to the DSM for dissociative identity disorder. There's two pages of them. So when it comes to causes, we do know that dissociative identity disorder is usually based on a history of severe chronic trauma, often abuse, that's occurred in childhood. It's very closely related to PTSD because it is a way for a child or a young person to deal with the trauma they're experiencing. It's thought that these other, other personalities kind of take over and help the child endure the pain they can't suffer. It's kind of an escape from the trauma. We know that there's also biological vulnerability um, that could be possible. That could be something that runs in families. When it comes to treatment, the focus is on reintegration of the identities so that the host is the only person who's really in charge. But of course, that takes some work on trauma and um, dealing with um, triggers and things that have created what, you know, the, the um, alternate personalities um, are there for a reason. So once the, the host is able to handle those things, then the alternates aren't needed. The patient may have to relive and confront some early things that um, could be achieved through hypnosis, but has to be addressed. As we're discussing dissociation, it's also important to think about false memories. So false Ooh. memories are fairly easy um, to create um, through suggestion. Um, there's been a lot of work on false memories um, by the psychologist Elizabeth Loftus. Um, um, there's an interest in repressed memories that has led some patients to think that they've repressed memories of abuse, which can later, which has later been found to be false. Because sometimes we can ask people things in the wrong way and we can make them assume that something traumatic has happened to them when it hasn't. So therapists who are working with um, patients with any type of dissociative disorder has to be well-trained in memory function um, and care so that they're careful not to um, suggest that something um, is true or has happened in the person's life that hasn't really happened. So if we were to summarize somatic symptom disorders and dissociative disorders, we always have to realize that for somatic disorder, those physical problems occur without any type of organic or medical cause. And when it comes to dissociative disorders, these are extreme distortions in perception and memory. And there's not really a lot of treatment uh, for many of these disorders. So that is everything I wanted you guys to know um, about chapter five. I hope it clarified uh, some of the things you read in the text.